The following presentation was produced by the Buddhist Society of Victoria. Please visit our website at bsv.net.au. Namo tassa bhagavato arahato samma sambuddhassa Namo tassa bhagavato arahato samma sambuddhassa Namo tassa bhagavato arahato samma sambuddhassa Mayam bhante Tisarane na saha pancha silani ya chama Tutiampi mayam bante Tisarane na saha pancha silani ya chama Tatiampi mayam bante Tisarane na saha pancha silani ya chama Say after me Buddhang saranang gachami Dhammang saranang gachami Sanghang saranang gachami Dutiyampi buddhang saranang gachami Dutiyampi dhammang saranang gachami Dutiyampi sanghang saranang gachami Tatiyampi buddhang saranang gachami Tatiyampi dhammang saranang gachami Tatiyampi sanghang saranang gachami Tisarana gamanang nititang Panati pata veramani sikha padang samadhyami Adinna dana veramani sikha padang samadhyami Kame sumicha chara veramani sikha padang samadhyami Musavada veramani sikha padang samadhyami Surame raya majja pamadatthana veramani sikha padang samadhyami Tisarane na sadhing panchanga samannagata silang dhammang sadhukhang surakkitang katva appamadena sampadeta. Yavata bhagava loke titteya tavasasanang tavata pati ganha tu puja lokanu kampaya. Ganasarapaditena dipena tamadansina Tiloka dipang sambuddhang pujayami tamonudang Vanna ganda gunopetang etang kusuma santating Pujayami munindasa siripada saruruhe Pujemi buddhang kusumena nena punyena metena jahotu mokkang 
Bhuppam milayati atai dhamme kayo tatayati vinasa bhavam Namo tas bhagavato arahato samma sambuddhas Namo tas bhagavato arahato samma sambuddhas Namo tas bhagavato arahato samma sambuddhas Iti piso bhagava arahang samma sambuddho Vija charana sampanno sukato loka vidu Anuttaro purisa dhamma sarati Satta deva manusanam buddho bhagavati Swakato Bhagavata Dhammo Sandittiko Akaliko Vehipasiko Opanaiko Pachatam Vedita Bovinyuhiti Supati Panno Bhagavato Savaka Sangho Ujupati Panno Bhagavato Savaka Sangho Nyaya Pati Panno Bhagavato Savaka Sangho Samichi Pati Panno Bhagavato Savaka Sangho Yadi Anchattari Purisa Yugani Atta Purisa Pugala Esa Bhagavato Savaka Sangho Aulayo Pahulayo Dakineyo Anjali Karaniyo Anuttaram punyaketang lokasati Evang me sutang ekang samayam bhagava Savatiyang viharati jetavani anati pindikasa arame Atako anyatara devata abhikantaya ratiya Abhikanta vanna kevala kappang jeta vannang obhasetva Yena bhagavate nupasankhami Upasankhamitva bhagavantang abhivadetva ekamantang atasi ekamantang thitako sa devata bhagavantang gataya ajabhasi Bahu deva manusa cha mangalani achintayam Akanka mana sotanam bruhi mangalam mutamam Aseva na cha balanam banditanam cha seva na Puja cha puja niyanam etam mangalam mutamam Patirupadesa vaso cha pubbe cha kata punyata Atta samma cha miti cha etam mangala mutamam Pahusak cha ncha sippan cha vinayo cha susikito Subhasita cha yava cha etam mangala mutamam Mata pitu patta nang putta daras sanggaho Anakula cha kammanta etang mangala mutamang 
Upasamantute. This is what should be done by one who is skilled in goodness and who knows the path of peace. Let them be able and upright, straightforward and gentle in speech, humble and not conceited, contented and easily satisfied, unburdened with duties, and frugal in their ways, peaceful and calm and wise and skillful, not proud or demanding in nature, let them not do the slightest thing that the wise would later reprove, wishing in gladness and in safety May all beings be at ease, whatever living beings they may be, whether they are weak or strong, omitting none, the might of the mighty, medium, short or small, the seen and the unseen, those born far away, those born and to be born, may all beings be at peace, let one deceive another, or despise any beings in any state, let none dishonor or ill will, wish harm upon another, even as a mother protects with her life her child, her only child, so with a boundless heart should one cherish all living beings, radiating kindness over the entire world. Spreading upwards to the skies and downwards to the depths, outwards and unbounded, free from hatred and ill will, whether standing or walking, seated or lying down, one from drowsiness, one should sustain this recollection. This is said to be the sublime abiding by not holding the false views, the free-hearted one, having clarity of vision, being free from all sense desires, is not born again into this world. Sabbitiyo vivajjantu sabbaro go vinasatu mate bhavantvantarayo sukhi vidayuko bhava abhivadana silisa nichang buddha pachalino chattaro dhamma vardhanti ayyuvano sukham balam Sabba roga vinimutto, sabba sampatti vajjito, sabba vera mati kanto, nibbuto chatuam bhava, bhavatu sabba mangalangra, kantu sabba devata, sabba buddhan bhavena, sada soti bhavantute, Bhavatu sabha mangalam grakam tu sabha devata sabha dhamma nubhavena sada soti bhavantute Bhavatu sabha mangalam grakam tu sabha devata sabha sangha nubhavena sada soti
Hello, this is Ajahn Brahm here, if you remember me, that I've been coming to uh, the Buddhist Society of Victoria uh, in Wolverine East for I don't know how many years. And this year, unfortunately, because of COVID, I cannot uh, go over to celebrate the Waisak with you in the Buddhist Society of Victoria. And I think this is the first time in something like 30 years that I haven't been to Melbourne to celebrate the Waisak. But nevertheless, uh, at least I can send our best wishes from uh, the western part of Australia to the eastern part of Australia, wishing you a very, very happy time at this Waisak season. And to uh, remind you, you may be celebrating this Waisak at home and if you are celebrating the Waisak at home, please recall that even the Lord Buddha, he became enlightened sitting under the Mahabodhi tree alone. And sometimes a seclusion, once we know how to make use of it, is not an obstacle at all, but it's a great blessing. A time when you don't have to worry about where you're sitting and being disturbed in your home you have the opportunity to find the space, the peace, the freedom in order to meditate or to study some of the suttas or listen to some of the teachings. And so there's so much you can do there. So don't waste the opportunities. It's not the same as before, but you can make it better. A good Buddhist will always adapt to whatever situation they come across. And when we learn how to adapt and make the most of the changing situations of life, there's nothing which we can't uh, develop and make more of. So today, please do the chanting. Please keep your precepts. Please meditate and study and make this a special day today. This is your Waisak celebration. And that Waisak celebration is something very, very, very important. You recall how the Lord Buddha sat under a tree and got so peaceful and still and became fully enlightened. It's a great blessing for our world and how previously he was born and how at the very end of his life he passed away. Passed away peacefully, laying on his right side, meditating and then went into the state of cessation Parinibbana is a great blessing for the whole world. So for those three great events of today, the birth, the enlightenment and the final passing away, please regard those occasions with great respect, inspiration and action to do all that is good and help support the Buddhist Society of Victoria who is making these recordings possible. And I was asked to give a little Dhamma talk uh, for the Waisak Day, so that all of those listening in Victoria at least can have a little bit of Dhamma from myself uh, for celebrating of Waisak. And the committee over in the BSV, the really hard working and sacrificing committee, do so much hard work, as well as um, uh, trying to build up Newby Buddhist Monastery, which is a lot of work. Even so, they managed to arrange these celebrations for the most holy day of the Buddhist year, the Waisak. And they did ask me to give a little talk, only for half an hour, uh, on just how to become a stream winner, a soul one. It's a question many people often ask. And the first point I would like to make is if you do read the suttas, these are the authentic teachings of the Buddha, the only teachings we can really rely on as being authentic and meaningful and a good guide to the path, that in those uh, teachings, I was confused for many years that it seemed that almost anybody could become a stream winner. And the most surprising example of that were that those uh, assassins who were hired to actually to kill the Lord Buddha. You may remember that one assassin was supposed to kill the Buddha 
and then two assassins to kill that one assassin, four other killers to call, kill those two, eight to kill the four, 16 to kill the eight, and I think 32 to kill the 16, to try and leave no trace of who was responsible. But when that first assassin came up to the Buddha, the Buddha was unable to be killed. It was just too kind, too peaceful, too uh, valuable to be killed. And the, the assassin just could not make himself do that and ask forgiveness. And the Buddha gave him a little sermon and that assassin became a stream winner according to the, the text. And so did the two who were looking for the one. So did the four who came looking for the, the two. All of these assassins, killers, actually met the Buddha and it became a stream winner straight away. And that made it very difficult for me to understand at first now, what actually is a stream winner? And the answer came later on in looking at those suttas and practicing uh, myself. The answer came that when a person uh, has entered the stream, is on the path to being a stream winner, then their attainment of stream winning is guaranteed in this life either sometime in this life or at least at their death moments, that they will penetrate and actually reach being a stream winner, the fruit of stream, win stream winning. And in the Vinaya, these are monastic rules, which is where I learned my Pali. I studied the Vinaya first and the Pali of the Vinaya to really get a good understanding of how the Buddha taught the Vinaya for the monastics amongst other nuns. That there, they said if someone, if someone was about to die, if their death was certain, if they were caught in a trap in which they could not escape, then they were called dead. But even though their heart was beating and their lungs were breathing and their brain was active, their death was certain Therefore, the Pali idiom was that they were dead. It reminded me of those movies, those bad movies I used to watch when I was a lay person, when somebody who had done something terribly bad to some gangsters who were very cruel and very um, violent, and they told this man, you're dead. Even though he was still walking, he was still alive, his death was certain. Therefore, they said, you're dead. And it's the same with those um, assassins. Those assassins who tried to, to kill the Buddha but could not do it. They were so inspired by the Buddha's example and by his powers that they had faith in the Buddha. And even though they weren't a stream winner yet, their stream winning was certain. It would happen before they died or at their death moment, because they had entered the stream as those on the path. So sometimes there's very little distinction in the written word of Pali between those on the path to being a stream winner and those who have gained to being a stream winner. So one of the first things required is that faith, that confidence, that these teachings or these teachers or the Buddha himself was a fantastic, powerful, authentic being who taught something which was extraordinary in this world, the Dhamma. And so once a person has that faith, that confidence, real confidence in what the Buddha said, then the sign of that confidence is they're going to follow those teachings. You're going to put them into practice, not out of blind faith, but faith which always checks what you do, what happens. And certainly that I can see that process in my life. And when you learnt about the Buddha's teachings, you wanted to practice them, to try them out. Maybe that's the reason why I was a, as a scientist, always wanted to check things out, put, ex do experiments. And even little things like precepts, the Buddha advised you, please keep those precepts. It's even like the five precepts. 
I was a young man, still in society, going to parties. Giving up alcohol was a hard thing for me to do, I thought. But then, once I gave it up, I had so much more happiness and peace and freedom. It was strange, but it was true, I could feel it. Because I experimented and did it and see what happened. And so my faith turned into practice. And the practice gave me experience. And that was just with precepts. First five and then later on eight. And I still remember just even when I was a school teacher, having a, a job in the world before I left to go and become a monk, I would go on Waysack Day. I get up very early in the morning in Devon, which was a long way away from any temple. I would get up early in the morning and I would uh, get to the train in Honiton Station, it's the nearest station to where I lived, and go all the way to Waterloo, from Waterloo to Richmond Station, Richmond, get on a bus to go to the Thai Temple, which was then in East Sheen in Richmond, outside of Richmond, sorry. And then I'd spend all day there, and keeping eight precepts, and then in the late afternoon, evening, get back, get on the train, and go back home, which arrived very late in the night time, and then get up in the morning the following day to go to work. You just, you was just so inspired. You almost had to do this, and it's enjoyable to do. The path was practiced, and it realized results. Happiness, peace, and also a strange thing which happened was that it gave you energy. This wonderful boost inside, which made it so much easier whether to teach or to meditate. This is, uh, being a school teacher, I was only 22 at the time. Whatever I did, you had more oomph to your life when you kept these precepts and you allowed yourself to get inspired. So little by little, you carried on and you started meditating. When I, of course, became a monk, you realized much more just this is only the start of that path of becoming a stream winner. That the path of being a stream winner, in short, what is it? The Eightfold Path. This Eightfold Path is the way, the perfect way, the best way, the chief of all ways. So it has to be all of these, not just keeping precepts, which is, you know, the, the right speech, right action, and right livelihood. But it's also what comes before and what comes afterwards. And the right view, first of all, you put aside some of your views, the views you've grown up with, and just test out to some of these views the Buddha said. But views are some of the hardest, to, especially the bad views one has, or the wrong views, or the perverted views. To get those out of the one system is so, so difficult. And I bring up a story now, I'm sure you've heard it before, but this was the story I got from one of my friends from Cambridge, who was also a Buddhist, was also a, th a theoretical physicist, and also a member of the Psychic Research Society. And when he came to a conference we held here in Perth a few years ago, caught up again, and he told me that one of these amazing experiments which were done on the levitating flower pot. The levitating flower pot, another scientist, by the way, this gentleman I'm talking about is Professor Bernard Carr, Emeritus Professor of Theoretical Physics at Queen Mary College in London University, and a close uh, associate of the late Professor Stephen Hawkins. So, you know, he knows what he's talking about, this Bernard Carr, but he was also, as a good scientist should, as a good Buddhist does, always investigates and challenges and, and takes one's knowledge to a deeper level. And so one of his friends claimed he could levitate a flower pot and brought it into a room at um, Imperial College in London, put it on the bench and asked all the professors, every one of the professors in the room, because these were high-flying physicists and other scientists, 
we need some help to levitate this flower pot. Can they all start chanting, Om, Om, Om? And they all did. And as they did, the flower pot rose up into the air. It levitated, it worked. They filmed it, they photographed it, the evidence was there, but one or two of those physicists noted for their experimental acumen, their skill in observing details, refused to admit that it levitated. They maintained that that flower pot stayed on a table all the time. And of course, if you've heard about this experiment before, there was a huge electromagnet put under the table. It lifted up from that table, from that bench, according to normal science rules. But getting everyone to chant Om, Om, Om was to mask the current being turned on because very strong currents always can be heard. But that wasn't the point of the experiment. The point of the experiment was to say that even though it lifted, if that challenged people's views so much, if they just could not admit that that levitated because that would change so much of their basic way of looking at the world, their perception would blot it out. They literally would not be mindful of it. It would be blocked, even though their were, eyes were open. That flower pot remained on the table all the time even though in reality it was lifting. That's the difficulty of how views can be the cause for perverting per perception. So what's actually happening we just cannot see. So, in order to get the right view, to become a stream winner, you have, now this is the, the fruit of stream winning, you have some faith. You have many of the details. But to actually to turn that into some reality, so you know that you are not bending the truth to suit your delusions. You're not just keeping those old ways and trying to justify them, trying to, to um, authorize them by some weird logic. Like you know that old saying, I was reading this, in one of my books, which someone was publishing the other day, that in Thailand, when I first went there, everybody in the Northeast was a Buddhist. They all said they kept the five precepts, but they would eat fish. I said, what are you eating fish for? You're killing the fish. And this is the way we twist the world to suit ourselves. They said, well, we don't kill the fish. We just take them out of the water and they die by themselves. And of course, that is an excuse. That is amazing that anyone could take that seriously, but they did. So a lot of times, how many of our views are wrong and are just excuses for our sense of ego and self to do what we want. So little by little, we actually practice this path. And we have our practice, especially after the precepts of meditation. And you've got to say that because the whole purpose of meditation, or one of the main purposes of meditation, is to abandon your five hindrances. These five hindrances which block wisdom and which weaken one's meditation. And these hindrances, what are they? It's like will. It's will, which you only see what you want to see. It's ill will, which is in denial to what challenges you. It is restlessness. You're not steady enough to see anything. It's dullness. You're in a stupor most of the time. And the doubt, when anything comes up, oh no, this can't be true. You're thinking too much. And those five hindrances have to be abandoned, have to be lessened, have to be softened until they're not there. And how? How do we abandon those five hindrances? Especially wanting and not wanting. That is the job of meditation. Of deep stillness. And if you can enter these stages of deep meditation, you practice it. You're letting go 
of this body, which is very disturbing. You're letting go of time. Past and future gives you too many distractions. All the busyness of your life is in the past or in the future. In this present moment, you're free. And all of the speech, all these words, which are just pointers to the truth, but which people mistake as being the truth. And we argue over words. We pull all those, all those words aside. We're silent. Because only in silence are you listening to the Dhamma, instead of having an argument with the Dhamma. You're listening, receiving information. And even if what you're seeing, what you're feeling, what you're knowing is strange and weird, you're courageous enough, you're committed enough to see the truth, to allow it to teach you. So with those five hindrances, stop for a while. You have the opportunity to see the Dhamma. And what do you see? I was reminded of a simile which I gave, oh, maybe 20, 25, 30 years ago of the driverless bus. It's just like you're in a bus journey, a journey of life. And sometimes that your journey goes to wonderful territory, having a great time. And sometimes the bus goes through terrible places and you can't get out of there fast enough. But you tell the driver of your bus, this is a metaphor for your life. Tell the driver of your bus, speed up, get out of here quickly. This is a terrible situation I'm in. And what does your bus driver do most of the time? Slows down or even stops and parks. So the unpleasant times of your, last, of your life last longer. And then, and then, sometimes your bus driver is going through a beautiful territory, wonderful, peaceful, happy times, great meditation in a monastery somewhere, or it's like being in heaven. And you tell the, you tell the bus driver, um, slow down, I want to enjoy the pleasant moments of my life. And what does the bus driver do? Puts his feet on the accelerator and speeds out of there. So all the good times, the happiness doesn't last as long as it should, or as long as you think it should. So after a while of trying to control your happiness in life, more happiness and less suffering, you realise it's the bus driver's fault. Your bus driver doesn't know how to run or drive this bus called your life. And the bus driver, his name is, by the way, is Will. Will calls the shots. Will makes the decisions. So eventually you have to find Will to teach Will how to drive a bus properly. So you have to leave your seat. In other words, let your body vanish you go to deep meditation. And to go into the mind where after a lot of stillness you come face to face, as it were, with this thing called the will. This mind which causes all this trouble. And then you get one of the great shocks of your life. It is real, but it's not what you expected. The will is not there. The bus driver's seat is empty. It goes according to courses and conditions, that's all. There's no one there. When that experience hits you hard, then you go back to your seat in your bus and you stop complaining. There's no one to complain to. There's no one to ask, drive out of here. No one to tell, stop. You're craving. Your desires are abandoned. Seeing the bus driver's seat is empty shows you that one of the first parts of no self, no permanent essence. You are not the one who calls the shots of your life, who makes the decisions. As it says in the Mahavedala Sutta, one of the first, the, the two causes of seeing 
and breaking through to right view, becoming a stream winner, attaining the, the fruit of stream winning. Is actually to have the words of another. You can't do this by yourself. You do need that instruction. And to go to the source of things, yoni manas hi kara. Go to the source, go inside, go and find out where that will is and see. It's not there. And this is not science, this is meditation insight practice. And you go deeper. You're not really finished yet, to see the one who knows, this knower. See in meditation that that too vanishes as well. There's nothing in here. That great occasion when Ajahn Chah, my teacher, decided to try and enlighten me. On that occasion I had a beautiful meditation, a couple of hours of bliss, and then I decided to go and see if I can be of assistance to him. And of course he saw straight away as I went towards him and he was coming the opposite direction that I had just come out of a really nice meditation, a deep meditation. And he'd really tried his best to enlighten his stupid disciple by asking me, Brahma Wangsa, he said to me, why? I said, I don't know. And then he said, he laughed, how stupid I was. But then he looked at me again and said, I'll tell you the answer anyway. And the answer to the question why, this is nothing. There's nothing here. It's empty. And of course you all remember, then he said, do you understand? I said, yes. He said, no, you don't, and walked away. <laughs> but he gave me one of the great important parts of being a stream winner. There's nothing. Stream winning is not an attainment. It's a letting go, it's a vanishing. There's so many wrong views disappearing. And with it, so many desires and wants. I often say, and I've got to finish off in a few minutes, there are only two types of freedoms in this world. One is the freedom of desire, which is a false freedom. The freedom of desire is your ability to go where you want, get what you want, do what you want, when you want. And that's why many people try and become rich and powerful. But that's not a freedom at all. If I wanted freedom of desire, I would not have become a monk. I'd have become some millionaire or billionaire or some prime minister or president who can try and get whatever they want when they want it. I know. Instead of the freedom of desire, the Buddha talked about the freedom from desire. We don't want anything. You're happy no matter what happens. It comes, it doesn't come, all the same. Imagine that, the freedom from desire. Well, this mind doesn't need things. You can say no, you can say yes, it doesn't really matter. And then little by little, when there's nothing to do, you become still, peaceful. All those deep meditations are a test to see whether you really have understood about freedom from desire. When there's no desire, there's nothing to do, you do nothing, you're still. When you're still, the knower vanishes. The two depend upon one another. You soon get the message, there's no one here. You actually become a stream winner. You don't go around telling other people. You don't put it like a, a stripe on your robe. One stripe for stream winner, two stripes for once returner, three stripes for non-returner and a little pip on your shoulder or a star or a crown or something for, a, a, not a, for an arahat. These are cases of people disappearing, vanishing. And little by little, the more we vanish, we don't attach this I to being a stream winner. I's disappeared. The sense of me is hardly left. Then you know that that's getting 
in the right area of so what, the street winning. When there's an eye there, there's going to be suffering. There's going to be wanting and frustration in a sense of a, of a, a knowing. All happening just to try and, try and uh, fulfill the desires in this world. When you realize a freedom from desire is the very, very best. When you just sit here, I don't want anything in the world except to let go, to give up, to renounce as much as possible. That is the path. So I talked a lot as usual, so I hope it was useful for you. Of course, I don't get any feedback sitting here in an empty room in front of a camera. It is literally an empty room here. No one's here at all except the Dhamma. And so I hope you enjoyed that. And I wish you all the best for Waysack. Again, my apologies, I can't be there uh, in physical person. There's no physical person anyway, so it's nice to be able to share and give some Dhamma. May you all be happy and well, and hopefully next year be back uh, in uh, um, BSV in uh, Victoria uh, in person next year. So may you all be happy and well. And I'll finish off with a very short blessing for you all. Sabha roga winimuto sabha santa pawajito sabha vera mati gando nibuto chato wang bawa sabi tio iwa chantu sabha roga we nasa to mate bo wan wan tarayo suki di ga yu go pa wa api wa dan ha si lit sa ni chang wu ta pa chali no chataro dama wa tan ti a yu wan o sukang. Bala. Happy Waysack to Victoria and Melbourne especially. Thank you for joining us for the uh, Waysack ceremony here from the Newbury. Fortunately, we couldn't be there in, in live in, in um, BSV in our Marvin Temple. It's a strange time, but it's better than nothing. It was really interesting for us to do it this way. Um, we would have preferred to see everybody and have a nice ceremony here in Newbury, but we do it this way. Maybe next year we we'll do it again live. Anyways, it was happy to uh, do that. We were happy to do the chanting for everybody, and uh, we'll see again when we uh, when we um, the, all the virus and everything will be over. But we it's uh, definitely always we need to do these ceremonies like Vesak because it's the the, the Buddha's birthday enlightenment and the, the uh, Parinibbana day. So um, it's a great thing that we can actually do these ceremonies, at least if we, even if we do them uh, online. So there was Bante Murito here from Newbury. Nice to see everybody. And now for Ayopek. Thank you, Bante. Okay, this is Opeka representing everyone, uh, especially the female community, not forgetting all the uh, monastics and lay too, and all the volunteers who have contributed towards Newbury Buddhist Monastery. Um, um, I think Bane has said most of the things that is uh, supposed to be said, uh, but what I like to um, remind myself and perhaps to everybody too, that you know, Vesak uh, is actually a day where we commemorate Lord Buddha's uh, birth, um, enlightenment and passing away, uh, all for a very, very good reason. Now, um, this uh, uh, virtual uh, Vesak celebration is actually a reminder for us to understand the teachings of Buddha that things are impermanent, anicca. So instead of the usual celebrations that we're having, we're having it through camera and recording. So we'd like to thank those so many people, the committee members, the subcommittees, the volunteers, so many. Uh, as I say, it's hard to name them all. Everyone, including Sri Juth and London, who are here helping us to get this over to everyone to celebrate Visak in a very special way this year. 
So please have a very lovely, quiet, uh, stay home visit, and may you all have a the spiritual maturity soon to get out of the sufferings of samsara by following the Buddha's teaching and walking on the Noble Eightfold Path, guided by our Aryang teachers. Sadhu, sadhu, sadhu. And one thing for me, I just wanted to remind, next Sunday we will be joining us here again, maybe from this hall, and to have a virtual opening ceremony for, our, um, for the Sangha House and the Kuti. So we'll see you next Sunday. Sadhu, sadhu, sadhu. Sadhu, sadhu, sadhu. Thank you. Have a beautiful, quiet and peaceful. <laughs>